Let me again apologize, but we have to vote around here. And if you don't vote, they'll put your name in the newspaper. <laughs> so let me begin, I guess, this question probably to you, Mr. Kundra, and to uh, um, Mr. McClure, maybe. Um, it seems to me that the shift to cloud computing will move a lot of responsibility that we currently maintain in-house to contractors. What impact will that move have on the federal I IT workforce? We we'll lose a lot of jobs as a result of this. Um, so if I can step back for a second and, uh, and looking at the current environment that we're in. So for example, based on the FISMA report um, of last year, there are over 4,000 systems in the United States government uh, that are maintained by contractors. Just to give you uh, examples of that, so with the Navy, uh, their network infrastructure, uh, the way over 300,000 desktops are maintained and operated by EDS slash HP. Our travel system in the U.S. government, for example, uh, Northrop Grumman actually manages that infrastructure. So, so, so I want to be really careful as we talk about cloud computing in terms of how we treat it versus other IT systems. Like any technology, part of what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, as we move towards the cloud, that what federal employees are doing, they're armed with training and that we're focusing on work, as I highlighted on my um, earlier slide in my opening testimony, that serves the American people. And what I mean by that is making sure that there's appropriate training, uh, a path to actually fundamentally re-engineering the, the functions of those agencies. But cloud computing is not something that's going to uh, change the way in terms of uh, the procurement side of it because what we're already doing is we've already engaged in the last 10, 20, 30 years in a lot of outsourced systems and this is just another area that we're applying security and standards to. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think it's a, it's a good question in terms of the workforce impact. Um, as you know, a lot of uh, federal IT spending is on infrastructure. And as we free up uh, some of the uh, personnel that are actually dedicated to legacy maintenance of legacy systems and infrastructure, you can move them to more high value um, job categories and into analytical kind of categories for the information. And I just draw on my own experience with USA.gov that was heavily dependent upon a staff that was engaged in day-to-day -day operations and maintenance activities, uh, the updates, the patches, and so forth. By moving it to a, a cloud environment, we freed up those people to actually f focus more of their time on applications for true business needs and high-value security functions. So that, I think that, that's the fundamental shift that, that could occur here, is that we're actually enabling an IT workforce in the government to be more focused and more targeted on high-value needs that we have. All right. Thank you very much. Let me just say, uh, I guess this to you, Mr. Wilkinson. Uh, it seems clear to me that there are certain things that should never be placed in the cloud, particularly classified or maybe even sensitive information because it is simply not worth the risk, I don't think. Uh, uh, do you agree? I would say that uh, there are certain applications and information in which it would probably be perhaps be imprudent to put in a cloud, but it really depends on what type of cloud is being used, whether it's a private cloud perhaps behind an agency's firewalls, and specifically what types of controls and the effectiveness of those controls that are placed over uh, the systems operating in that, in that particular cloud. Uh, it's important to remember that the individual systems that are being used, uh, in, even in the traditional sense now at many agencies, uh, we've reported over years that many of them are not that secure in and of themselves. And it really gets down to assuring that the security controls over the systems that are processing the information are effective and, and, and protecting the uh, 
information, be it classified information, be it unclassified or sensitive information to the level that's required. But I would say that certainly uh, what agencies are doing now are kind of taking a go slow approach in terms of limiting the type of information that they are putting in the cloud implementations that they're presently using. Uh, most agencies uh, that we looked at are using kind of like low impact or low sensitivity information for those clouds which are uh, particularly those that may be in a public cloud and even in the private clouds they're still using uh, for the most part low impact information until they work out the issues related to adequately securing uh, that information and, and indeed one of the risks that we've uh, identified with our report is the fact that it may be difficult for agencies to currently assess the security and risk over the uh, cloud implementations that are available. Right. Thank you very much. I see my time has expired. Uh, gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chafee. Thank you, and thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Um, I was, you, you've, it's very encouraging to see the presentations. Uh, it makes immense sense, uh, I, particularly Mr. Kundra. Kundra, I, I appreciate that. How do you get everybody moving in the same direction, though? I mean, you, you just know the discussion is going to happen. You're going to go over to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and they're going to say, "Oh, but you don't understand us," and "Oh, we got all this safety and security, and we have to have our own proprietary system." I mean, how do you standardize? How do you push them? I mean, because I think we'd probably all sit down and say, "Oh, we need a unified." Uh, way to move forward, but the reality is that's why we end up with the thousands of different legacy systems that we have. So how do you do that? I, I don't have a solution to that. So, so part of the way we're addressing that challenge, it's um, grounded in the, the budgeting process. So as part of the fiscal year 2012 budget process, what uh, agencies are doing is they're actually developing plans um, to consolidate infrastructure, to consolidate data centers. And uh, that activity is vital as we think about where does it make sense for us to continue to invest in uh, infrastructure versus where are there opportunities to move to the cloud in a safe and secure manner. Second thing is the program management office that we've stood up at GSA, where that's the center of gravity where, with the, the leadership that's being provided from an execution perspective. Third is making sure with the Federal CIO Council that we create the appropriate economic incentives. And what I mean by that is consider what it takes right now for any vendor to actually get certified to sell to the U.S. government. Well, you've got such a high barrier for entry because you've got to get certified if you're dealing with CDC, NIH, or if you're dealing with the FBI, and then you've got to go deal with GSA that it's very difficult because the economics or the economies of scale don't work out. So from a security perspective, one of the things we're doing um, in cloud computing is we've launched the FedRAM program where we're going to create a certification board um, made up of members from the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, from GSA, and an agency that actually wants to procure that technology so that you go through that certification, but you don't just stop there you've moved towards a continuous monitoring environment. So you're not just generating paperwork reports from a security so, but, perspective. But is the idea that if you meet that minimum standard that would uh, suffice for, say, some of these that truly do warrant more uh, sophisticated uh, security type applications, that if you meet that standard that all the rest of the agencies would fall into line? Is that the idea? Absolutely. That they will be able to then leverage the work that's been done across the federal government. To, to give you a, a simple example, the State Department over the last six years has spent $138 million on these paperwork exercises um, as far as certification and accreditation is concerned. And that is multiplied across the board with multiple agencies and departments. And what we're trying to do is move away from this environment of just generating paperwork reports and much more towards continuous monitoring and that's an area that NIST has been spending a lot of energy in terms of how do we get real-time data on the security of the systems rather than just reports. You know, uh, some of the business models that we see out there that use a kind of a version or cloud computing, if you will, are reliant upon those eyeballs and then selling those eyeballs, in, a, in essence, in an advertising uh, manner to be able to say, oh, well, we can, we can supplement. It's free as long as you use it, but we're going to sell some advertising against it. 
Is there a standard that you've thought through and how that would work or not work? I mean, because the sensitivity of who's looking at that information, selling of advertising, those types of things may look appetizing to kind of defray the cost, but there's also some security issues on, on the companies taking that information and then, in essence, packaging it up to an advertiser. Have you thought through how that works or won't work? Well, so if we look at uh, the recovery board and mm -hmm. uh, its move to the cloud when it comes to recovery.gov, uh, they went through those issues. And part of what they did is as they were negotiating the contract, uh, and that's why I want to be careful as we think about uh, the, the move to the cloud not being something that's brand new, that's never happened. Right, right. It's essentially contracting. Uh, as I mentioned, we're moving towards uh, uh, contracting systems, whether we're dealing with Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, or a number of other companies. In the same way, Recovery actually said, you know what, with the cloud vendor, the data must be in the United States, and here are a set of prerequisite solutions. And frankly, they've got to comply with federal statutes such as FISMA and uh, security guidance that's come out of OMB and NIST. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I know my time's short, but I'm fascinated to continue on and having these uh, further discussions because my guess is, it's just a guess, but is that the law is woefully behind in terms of the velocity and the speed in which uh, the, these types of applications uh, change. It's just the nature of the beast. We'll have to be vigilant on that, And uh, but I appreciate the hearing today. Thanks for your input. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and now you yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to ask the panel uh, concerns about the current electronic privacy laws as, as we head towards this um, cloud computing. Uh, specifically, commentators have raised qu concerns about the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and that it hasn't changed in nearly 25 years. I'm also on the Judiciary Committee and we had a hearing on the fact that um, information in the clouds in large part is not protected by uh, privacy laws, whereas information in written communication is l protected by the privacy laws. And basically, uh, we, we have not changed these laws in, tw in these 25 years to accommodate this. So looking ahead, what steps should Congress take to ensure that the privacy of both individual information and government records is maintained? I think it's a great, uh, that's a great question. There were two um, directives that were issued by the OMB director last Friday dealing with this issue of protection of personal identification information on third-party sites, which are largely where a lot of SaaS uh, cloud applications are being used. And those issues were reinforced by the policy that the protection of personal identifiable information is in place, that agencies have to take steps to ensure that that is occurring. And if, if there is uh, personal identification information collected, that it's specifically uh, explained and posted why it's being collected and what it's being used for. So I think what we're doing in the policy area is, is actually bringing up some of the older policies for uh, inspection and looking at ways in which we can modernize them in this environment but still offer security and privacy protections that are fundamental to, to the data needs of the government. And are the specific laws that you think need to be changed and updated? I think the, the next step will be to open up and look at some of the laws. We're trying to look at the directive and guidance that can come out of the administration, out of the executive branch, because that's normally how agencies uh, implement uh, the basic fundamentals of law, the laws themselves. So step one, I think, is can we get greater velocity and movement in what these changes need to be? And then I think longer term, we can, we can open up some of the statutes. Then next, let me ask about security. Uh, concerns, and I believe in testimony this morning, Mr. Bradshaw from Google will argue that the cloud can provide better information security than current legacy systems, and in particular, uh, that the ability of agencies to store information in this in the cloud instead of on personal computers will actually allow for improved security. Uh, what do you think about this this argument? Well, I think when it comes to security, we need to remain ever vigilant. Whether that security in our uh, mobile devices or whether that's on systems that are government owned and operated or it's in a cloud environment. I don't think there's one answer that fits, a, uh, fits every single imaginable uh, implementation of these technology solutions. That's one of the reasons um, President Obama uh, 
after coming into office, quickly issued a directive to his Homeland Security Council and National Security Council to do a bottom-up review of cybersecurity. That's one of the reasons we've focused on investing over $3.6 billion in a comprehensive national cybersecurity initiative. And that's one of the other reasons what we've done is looked at our cyber posture and have said, look, we really need to move away from these paperwork exercises and to real-time monitoring of how the systems are implemented. It used to be that you could literally come in and certify a system um, and then come back three years later, which was the, the, the policy that was actually in place, and figure out whether it was still secure or not. But we've shifted that by guidance that we issued uh, that moves us to more of a real-time monitoring uh, approach where DHS, working with agencies, is going to make sure not only do we have continuous monitoring, but also investments in red teams that would actually look at our own systems to figure out if we have vulnerabilities or not. Uh, the days of just writing a report and hoping things are secure are over. Uh, we're confronting attacks on a real-time basis, therefore we must confront them with real-time monitoring on a continuous basis. And NIST has actually been doing some really good work in the space uh, from a framework perspective. Agreed. The uh, risk management framework defines ways to assess risk and so that the pro uh, program officials can actually make those decisions with the facts in front of them. So, so you're saying basically there'd be better oversight. I mean, you'd be monitoring this. But is there something inherent in the system that would make it more secure? For instance, is, would the information be fragmented in various well, locations? Well, from a, broadly speaking, uh, when you're able to concentrate uh, compute power in one place, you're inherently managing one system rather than ma managing hundreds and hundreds of systems and trying to get firewalls in place, uh, making sure that you're getting real-time traps of what's going on servers and routers and switches. So you can make that argument, but, I, but in my view, it, there needs to be a more fundamental shift, which is the, the cloud is not such a special technology necessarily that it's exempt or uh, from a security perspective, but it's just another implementation of, um, of IT, and it's a natural evolution of uh, where we've come from. And uh, Congressman Issa um, very well articulated sort of the historical evolution of where we've ended up in terms of cloud, but there are three big things that have happened. Number one is uh, bandwidth, the ability to have access to bandwidth in ways that were not available before. Number two is processing power. Uh, Moore's law and the ability to have processing power in ways that were not available before. And number three is storage, and the cost of storage has gone down exponentially. Therefore, now you're able to provide services in a centralized fashion that you couldn't before, but you still have to take the appropriate security safeguards. That's one of the reasons we've charged NIST with making sure that we're convening the right folks and that agencies have to comply with current statutes and security policy. And if I may add, uh, getting to the central question, is it more secure in a cloud versus in agencies' legacy systems? As I mentioned before, it really gets down to how secure uh, security is implemented over those systems. Uh, certainly, uh, we've reported in the past that agency legacy systems have had significant weaknesses in them. But there are some very real risks associated with putting information out in the cloud, particularly if they're public clouds to the extent that uh, agencies will now have to rely on the security of the service providers and assure and have mechanisms in place to assure that those providers are adequately securing the information that they are given in processing. And just because it goes out to the cloud does not necessarily make it more secure, but there are some risks associated with uh, it going out to the cloud. But there are possibilities where there are certain control elements that can help security over uh, this data, but at the same time, it gets back again to making sure there's verifiable implementation of s effective security that is over those systems. Gentlewoman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman, ranking member of the committee, gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I'm going to pick up right where you left off because the more or less, I'm going to ask a, a leading question. Uh, if I have five sites, let's say I'm the, the labs, you know, the Department of Energy labs, I have five sites, 
if those sites have a firewall and access to everybody inside to the internet. And I take all five sites and I take all the assets that are inside behind the firewall and I move them to the to a private cloud. I move them to one, two, or three sites out on the internet and I make a VPN connection with them uh, and I make all traffic to and from, no independent traffic, so it all goes there and then from those locations through those firewalls that are maintained, you know, I can also go out and surf the web. So I'm not taking away any result, but I'm simply moving everything to where your communication is simply to one or more locations, and then from there they're centrally located. Isn't it true I haven't changed anything at all that, that the, there is neither, assuming these are exactly the same assets just moved, I haven't changed a thing. They are neither any more nor less secure as a result. As long as the same set of security right. controls are implemented over the information. Okay, so as a baseline, I think you could all agree that location, as long as you have an internet portal, location out of that portal to some other location, if nothing else changes, makes no difference at all. It is neither more secure nor less secure. As long as your internet web portal is securely configured and, and secure. Right. Well, it's, you know, you're, you're only as secure as your firewall to begin mm -hmm. with. So now going over and looking at, at GSA and, and Mr. Kundra, let's, let's look at it another way. The bureaucracy. We know that we can move it, it, so every site, including the Congress, that is Internet access capable out of our firewalls. In other words, they're not closed systems. They're open to the web. We could take every one of them and we could move them to northern Canada so that we wouldn't have to worry about cooling year-round. And as long as we had the bandwidth, we would have changed nothing. Isn't that right? And we're, we're making the assumption. We're not going to cloud computing. We're just moving our data centers, you know, 500 milliseconds of, late, of latency time away, but we're moving them. Anyone disagree that we're changing nothing? Okay. So going back to those old systems of where we had a 1200 baud connection to some mainframe and we were going back and forth. The only thing that's really changed from those old systems in that, in that, in that situation is bandwidth. And bandwidth is no longer a limiting factor, right? In terms of, yes, but I mean, there's a lot more uh, as far as cloud is concerned. Okay. Now we want to get to being able to distribute our load, balance our load uh, uh, among one, more than one, but maybe hundreds or thousands of computing so that we get economies that we could not otherwise get uh, and the ability to have surge without having, as you said, the government solution that we have with cash for clunkers being you got to buy more PCs all the time. We want to have that in place, right? So I'm going to look at GSA and I'm going to say, why aren't you here today saying $80 billion, we would like $1 billion to put up resources that would be available to new requirements and to those who wanted to move from where we are to, to, to there, where that in a sense you'd be saying, look, we're not going to worry about your budget. We're going to worry about proving that we can take one billion and get what used to be two billion, but get it better, faster, and more reliable. Why are we not talking about a top-down implementation rather than the opening statement that sadly I heard where we talked about 500 people going to a big convention and, and get, trying to get buy-in. 500 people trying to get buy-in is what we were here a couple of weeks ago talking about when we find that agencies years after the GSA provides better, faster, cheaper solutions for uh, internet and tele tele uh, te telephone access telephony. Anyhow, uh, we, uh, we find that we don't have them because the bureaucracy is slow, because they have their, their systems, because th something as simple as is it safe or less safe. If the GSA took a billion dollars and said we're going to contract a world-class private cloud in which all the vendors have locked doors and separate everything, but we're going to prove that it still is better, cheaper, faster and provides that and we're going to make it available to innovative projects or to innovative people that are already wanting to move from owning to simply having. Why is it that's not what we're here today talking about? 
because otherwise I fear that it'll be 10 years from now and even though you'll have created the opportunity, the buy-in will be slow in coming. Well, Congressman, I think we are moving pretty aggressively in that area. We uh, already on our apps.gov store site have software as a service solutions available government-wide that provide economies of scale. We are about to award, uh, we, about, we just closed yesterday an infrastructure as a service blanket purchase agreement offering that should be able to leverage uh, uh, cloud-based infrastructure purchasing government-wide. So those vehicles, I think, we're rapidly putting in place to allow the economies of scale to, to actually work. There's a couple of... Uh, but each agency is going to have to make those individual decisions, make sure it fits, fits there, all the things we're hearing that slow the process down. Exactly, except remember what we've been talking about this morning also is a government-wide certification process for, for the security of these uh, infrastructure offerings, which is quite different from the way we've operated in the past. So an agency could get on our BPA, actually choose one, one of the vendors, but then each, award, each agency would go through its own certification, testing, and control processing. That's where the process has gotten very inefficient. If we uh, can successfully stand up a FedRAMP process that allows a consensus to be built around the testing and, and, uh, and controls being accepted by all parties, or if there is a variation that only the incremental testing is needed, not reinvention of it, we have uh, moved the ball, I think, considerably down the path much further than, than we have previously. We also have several uh, pilots. I think one of the other things we have to do, the question earlier was, um, uh, the bureaucracy not accepting this. So we've got pilots underway to show proof of concept in these cloud arrangements that, that I think can also move the needle further down, down the road by actually showing where these successes are, that security is in place and that cost savings are being produced. It's show me I'm from Missouri and I think that's a valid concern. That's why we're we're working collaboratively in the in the EGOV area to show some of these pilots uh, and, and their merits. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I might just note that although GSA doesn't control it directly, House Administration does, that you and I are part of a grand experiment where 540 servers in our individual offices are being moved to 540 virtual ones with no cloud capability, simply relocated. So as I went through that painful example of if you took everything and just moved it somewhere but didn't get any of the benefits of the cloud, you wouldn't have changed everything, anything. That's what we're doing in Congress. Right. You're Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman. You're right. Uh, I yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California. Thank you so much, Watson, Mr. Chairman. Um, who I'm been so very involved in this issue. I'm so glad that uh, we're working in conjunction with the full committee because uh, we've been looking at procurement and uh, we want to take a deeper look and I want to continue to restate uh, the purpose for today's hearing to look at the benefits and the risk of federal government's use of the cloud computing services. So if you don't mind, I'll uh, read my statement, my opening statement. Without objection. So ordered. At its basic level, the term cloud computing is a metaphor for internet-based computing, and some have described it as a new name for an old concept, and that's the delivery of computing services from a remote location, similar to the way electricity and other utilities are provided to the most customers. A uh, preponderance of technology experts believe that by 2020, most people will access software applications online and share and retrieve information through the use of remote server networks. This is a dramatic departure from today's environment where we depend on software housed on individual computers. The use of cloud computing by federal agencies has significant benefits for collaboration across a broad information infrastructure as well as for reducing costs associated with long-term information technology investments. It holds out the promise of enabling IT assets to remain on the technological cutting edge <coughs> over their life cycle as reduced cost. Uh, it is therefore appropriate that uh, President Obama has targeted 
the federal government's IT infrastructure as part of his mandate to cut agency budgets by 5% in 2011, particularly when we consider that the federal government spends $76 billion annually on IT investments and that the majority of these investments are for software and IT services. Despite these benefits, we remain concerned with the potential or unknown security risk associated with cloud computing across the federal agency community. For example, federal uh, customers may become dependent on their cloud computing vendors' effective implementation of security practices or protocols for ensuring the integrity and reliability of agency data and applications. The cloud computing model also raises privacy issues as well as a level of control over data due to issues of portability across different platforms or the fact that vendors may not be willing to divulge proprietary information. And due to these concerns, in July uh, 2009, uh, I requested that the GAO evaluate the technical and security risks associated with cloud computing across uh, the federal government. I'm pleased to announce that GAO is releasing the report at the hearing today, and you probably have heard some of it in my absence, uh, Mr. Greg Wilshulson, and who was just reporting when we recessed, uh, was uh, relaying some of the findings. The GAO report notes that while individual agencies have identified security measures needed when using cloud computing, they have not always developed corresponding guidance, and that OMB and GSA have yet to complete government-wide cloud computing security initiatives. Overall, I believe the report makes the point that cloud computing has both the advantages as well as disadvantages, Mr. Chairman, with respect to cybersecurity and that the administration should move deliberately and with caution in considering when or when not to use cloud computing platforms. Concerns involving vendor cybersecurity have not arisen in a vacuum or in an ad hoc manner. Specifically, we know through reporting done in the Wall Street Journal and other publications that multiple technology industrial-based companies, including Google, have been compromised by cyber attacks believed to be sourced from the People's Republic of China. It has subsequently been reported that both the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the National Security Agency have examined these episodes to determine the origins and the extent of damages sustained by all parties. Cyber attacks place personal data, intellectual property, and our national security at a grave risk and require our partners in government contracting communities to be over or ever vigilant in securing those systems and infrastructures used to service both federal agencies and private citizens alike. While I understand the aforementioned incidents may not be appropriate for discussion uh, in an open hearing, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe our vendor panelists need to address the broader issue of how they plan on meeting federal information security standards for protecting those programs and federal data that may be hosted through uh, the cloud uh, services. And uh, I, I really needed to be here full time to hear what the panelists have said, but if I might take a few moments to raise uh, a question. I would appreciate the time. Let me um, uh, suggest to the gentleman later that what I will do is recognize Mr. Lukemeyer right. and then come back that's, to you. That's fine. Thank you, right. Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Recognize Mr. Lukemeyer from uh, 
Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was under the impression that statements like that normally are submitted for the record, but I guess it's um, proper to read the entire thing. Um, Mr. Uh, if you have a statement, Wilson, you can read it. <laughs> I'm sorry? If you have a statement, you can read it. <laughs> I think that these gentlemen probably have more to do than listen to my statement, so I'd be glad to submit it to the record. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Wells Houston, uh, just kind of curious, uh, what percentage of the government's uh, different uh, duties and, uh, and, and agencies do you think would, would be appropriate to put uh, the cloud type of computing in place? Well, in terms of, uh, I don't know if I can really state what percentage of systems should be placed in the cloud. I think it really depends upon uh, what each agency f feels would be best uh, for its interest to go to a cloud environment. Uh, certainly, in doing that, there are a number of benefits that come by putting, placing systems and information out into the cloud. I think some of the other panelists have talked about those benefits, but they also have to weigh the risk in doing that. Uh, I, but I, I really couldn't hazard a guess as to what percentage of systems should be placed who, in the who cloud. Who approves the move uh, to go to the, to the cloud type of computing? Is that something that uh, there's a congressional committee that oversees this or is it just your department or various agencies or who, who has authority to make a decision like this to, to jump dump everybody's information into a cloud? I would think they'll probably be up to the individual agencies but perhaps uh, um, uh, Mr. Kundra or okay. might Mr. Kundra? be better able to answer that. Yeah, so it's, um, <clears throat> it's, it's like any it? other IT system. It would be the chief information officer of the agency and the chief information security officer to okay. make sure that uh, before moving any system to the cloud, that uh, one, they've made sure uh, they've taken into account all the statutory requirements, two, all the policy guidance around uh, privacy and security uh, that, that have existed for many years. What, uh, I know that there's a couple of uh, agencies and different groups already use uh, the cloud type of computing in, in our government. Uh, can you explain our, do you know how many? And are there other companies, uh, other states, other countries that have gone to this type of computing that we could look at as models and uh, just kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. So what I would uh, love to do is share with you a report we put together where we've highlighted uh, <clears throat> illustrative case studies, uh, whether that's at a state level, local level, and even within the federal government. But just to give you uh, one example, uh, GSA, as part of the Open Government Directive, when every agency had to engage within 45 days to get input from the American people, what GSA did is it provided a cloud solution and they went through the appropriate security protocols. And instead of every agency having to go out there and build a proprietary system, they were able to leverage this cloud solution and agencies instead focused actually on the content of how they're going to interact with the American people, how they're going to process that uh, input, rather than standing up yet another set of data centers or servers. Um, in your testimony, you uh, indicate that um, the administration announced three actions this week. Uh, the first one was to um, take under review uh, troubled IT projects across the federal government and identify serious problems. Uh, can you identify some of those serious problems and how this cloud computing would impact those? Would that be something that would work with this situation, or is it problems that are beyond this type of solution? Well, uh, well I think it's uh, there are larger problems in federal IT. So as we look at um, the fiscal year 2012 budget, the president has uh, called for a freeze on uh, non-defense national security spending and also the 5 percent cut that uh, agencies have to meet. And one of the ways agencies are going to be able to make sure that they're still delivering services effectively is through investments in information technology. Well, where are and some of the serious problems? Uh, is, if, is the cut your identified serious problem? No, so some of the, and what we want to make sure is that taxpayer money is being spent well. So some of these serious problems, the example what, I gave. Identify a serious problem for. I'm, I'm just curious as to what the problems were. So there procurement identified. cycles, for example, that may take uh, 18 months or problems around uh, the government scoping IT projects with deliverables that, uh, are, that take two, three, four years. And we've seen best practices 
where at the local state level or even the private sector where buyers are saying, look, you've got to deliver value in six months, not three years from today. We've also seen problems in terms of uh, how some of these systems are actually scoped, overly prescribing requirements that uh, will end up in failure as a result of everything being overly specified. Okay, so basically the problems you identified there were problems of process and procedure versus something that could be solved with the cloud. Is that correct? Right, well, cloud is a technology is by no means a silver bullet that's going to okay. solve all the IT problems we have. It's one approach. Uh, it's not the answer to everything that's mm -hmm. wrong with federal IT. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen from Missouri. Uh, now yield um, to the gentlewoman from California. Uh, five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, cost savings uh, estimates for the federal government derived from the use of cloud computing vary greatly, anywhere from uh, 25 percent to above uh, 90 percent in savings. Uh, the wide range in cost estimates is in part due to the fact that cloud computing is still evolving and savings are dependent on the type of cloud platform that is deployed. The required level of security is also an unknown variable. And what other uh, variables should we take into account in measuring potential savings from cloud computing? And what cost savings estimate can we reasonably expect? And let's uh, start with Mr. Kundra and then go right down the panelists. Sure. So from a savings perspective, it's um, very much around the problem you're trying to solve. And what I mean by that is when recovery.gov moved to the cloud, they saved uh, $750,000 uh, on an annual basis, which is very different than what GSA did when they moved USA.gov to the cloud. I believe it was $1.2 million? $1.7 million is what GSA saved. Uh, but in some cases, it may end up uh, costing more because of security requirements that would have to be implemented. So I don't think there's a single number uh, that's going to lead to these savings. There's a range. Right, well, even within the range, that's why you yeah. see such a wide, uh, in terms of degrees of freedom, from 25 to 99 percent or whatever the number is. Uh, for, for example, with the Open Government Directive, that was a nominal cost to provide a platform for every single agency um, uh, to, to engage the American people. We didn't have to go out there and spend millions of dollars and engage in a multi-year contract. So there's also a lot of cost avoidance as a result of leveraging uh, these cloud solutions. Uh, and as we look forward, part of what we're doing is we're making sure we recognize that the power here when we talk about cloud computing is it's also greener from a computing perspective because you don't have to go out there and keep building data center after data center. I mentioned earlier in my